When the COVID pandemic brought global travel to a standstill in 2020, the impact on the hotel industry was devastating. It was like nothing you could have imagined. It, it was a shock, it was, a, it was a kick in the butt. There's very little that didn't change during the pandemic for the global chains. It's comparable to maybe five consecutive 9-11s, what it did to demand. Marriott, the world's largest hotel chain, saw revenues plummet by 50% in 2020. Another blow came in early 2021 when CEO Arne Sorensen lost his battle with pancreatic cancer. Longtime Marriott executive Tony Capuano succeeded Sorensen, and despite these setbacks, he's optimistic about the future. Part of my confidence in the ability to lead the company through this crisis is I have the benefit of what I've called a long-tenured, battle-tested team. A key member of this team is CFO Lini Oberg. She really is unflappable in terms of the way in which she handles business challenges. I think she goes well beyond maybe the, quote, traditional CFO role. Uh, she's involved in every aspect of the business. Uh, the openings in Q4 were still right on target. We've even had a couple in Grocer Europe net. Uh, net. Not only is she obviously a wonderful steward of the company's balance sheet, but I rely on her heavily as uh, any leader would as we try to look around the corner. Part of our job is to make sure what do customers want, what are they thinking that they want next year and the next year, and that takes investment, and that takes thinking ahead of time of where you want to get. You could call Lini Oberg Marriott's chief future officer. I always loved finance. I did figure out that once I'd worked at a financial services firm that it was a great experience for a few years, but that I ultimately wanted to join a team for a more long-term way to try to build a business. Oberg joined Marriott as part of its investor relations group in 1999. As is often the case for many people, things evolve, the company grows, opportunities show up, and I really was able to build a set of skills and experiences that helped prepare me for the CFO role not only in corporate level roles, but also operational and international. She's been chief financial officer since 2016, the year Marriott acquired Starwood Hotels and Resorts and became the largest hotel chain in the world. Although that scale remains an advantage, all the industry's major players are finding it crucial to innovate in the wake of an unprecedented disruption. That was the, 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 the wake-up call for, you know, rethinking some of the operations and to try to figure out smarter ways to operate. The large hotel chains are uh, very much still in the mode of figuring out what the consumer is going to look like, what guest demands are, what preferences have changed. How does Marriott need to reinvent itself in these very uncertain times? I think a lot of the initiatives that were in place, a lot of the strategy that was in place, even before the pandemic began to unfold, will continue to serve us well. Uh, continued global growth. More than 60% of our pipeline is outside the United States today. I think that will continue to increase as a percentage. Uh, when you think about market share for the company, inside the U.S. we have about a 16% share of the hotel rooms, while outside the U.S. we have 3%. But no doubt I would expect that we will see greater growth rates of our rooms outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. Does that mean that you'll be putting more investments overseas as well? Well, investments is, a, is an interesting word, I, but the capital structure of deals varies a lot by market. So for example, uh, in some markets in Asia Pacific, there's far less use of debt, while in the US there is much more use of debt to construct a hotel. So the investment needs are often different for an owner outside the US than inside the US. Notice that she refers to owners. That's because Marriott owns a very small percentage of properties that carry its name. 
The majority are owned and operated by franchisees, while the company operates others under long-term management agreements. This asset-light business model presents the CFO with a unique set of opportunities and challenges. Because we don't own all of our hotels, we have far less debt. We would never have been able to grow as fast as we've grown and become more attractive to our customers without having the capital from all these hundreds of owners providing capital. The challenges of the model are you're managing a lot of different constituencies. You, you have to really consider the owner's needs and what's going on in the financing markets. I'd say the biggest challenge is around prioritization, about really picking your spots, going after them, going after them quickly with your investment dollars, and then adapting as times change. And in a time of rapid change, Marion has made it a priority to invest in technology. We've worked really hard to improve productivity and to be able to come up with innovation that both is attractive to the customer but also helpful to the owners. The fact that you can now go and have your mobile key and not have to stop by the front desk and that you can communicate about how you want your pillows, et cetera, all on your smartphone, that's both great for the customer, that's also great for the hotel. It allows them to plan better, allows them to run it more efficiently. There have been wonderful innovations. We're not done. We, we got plenty more to go. I think the key is to really enhance technology, but to realize that technology doesn't replace the face-to-face -face interaction. I have to make sure we do things right. After all, it's my name over the door. Uh, we are a people-first business, um, but how do we utilize technology to enhance the services we can deliver and make those services more efficient? Um, you know, with, uh, with the cost of wages going up and um, the cost of doing business uh, increasing every year, we have to figure out how to do um, more with what we have and how to utilize technology to become better at our craft. Coming up, Lini Oberg shows me how classic hospitality meets cutting-edge technology at one of Marriott's iconic hotels. On the digital platform, you can do so much in terms of communicating uh, with your customers. And guess what? It's also economically really efficient to be doing it that way. It's all about engagement. This is Bloomberg. Founded in 1927 as a root beer stand in Washington, D.C., Marriott has grown from a tiny family business into the world's largest provider of hotel rooms. As it's added millions of new customers, it's also expanded its customer loyalty programs. We were the first in the industry to have a loyalty program, so we understand the value and the importance of it. But in 2020, the public health crisis that ravaged global travel also threatened the consumer engagement these programs had built. Some of our most loyal customers didn't stay in a hotel for a year, but through our branded credit card programs, through the partnership with Uber that we rolled out, we found other mechanisms to keep connected with our customers, even in a period where they were grounded and not traveling at all. The partnership with Uber allowed Marriott Bonvoy members to earn points through rides and food orders. The credit card partnerships not only kept Marriott connected with customers, they connected the company with funds at a critical moment. What Marriott as well as Hilton did, they were in a position to generate cash by pre-selling points to their, uh, their credit card partners. That shows just how much the credit cards value the relationship. And, and you know, if you, you, you're willing to make a $1 billion cash advance to a hotel company that was, you know, stock price had dropped by 80, 85%, means you really value the relationship and you trust the partner. You truly trust the partner. They'll make millions and millions of dollars uh, from the branding of their of the credit cards. And then additionally with that, the consumers get the points on that. What we're seeing quite a bit this year is a lot of redemption of those points now that the world is opening up again. We've enabled our customers to have more choices in how to redeem those points. Um, they can redeem them within our hotels, they can redeem them outside of our hotels with the partnerships that we have through experiences, etc. But I think it really helps our customers stay within the ecosystem of Marriott. 
I got a view of that ecosystem from Lini Oberg when she showed me around the Marriott Marquis in Times Square. Originally opened in 1985, the hotel was recently given a $135 million renovation. We started in the newly remodeled M Club Lounge, a premier amenity for Bonvoy members. Making our loyalty members, now 157 million strong, making them feel welcome, special, and appreciated for their frequent travel with us really matters. It feels like you're trying to own the full experience of travel, whether it's through your co-branded cards or your travel insurance. Why is it important to bring your guests into this ecosystem? It's all about engagement. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. What are the trends that you're seeing in customers? Uh, particularly in the digital commerce space, it before obviously so many of our reservations were made by the telephone. We now see that well over a third of our reservations are made on our app. And on the digital platform, you can do so much in terms of communicating uh, with your customers. And guess what? It's also economically really efficient to be doing it that way. The digital future is already in place for Marriott guests, transforming everything from the check-in process to the traditional room key. But even as technology creates efficiencies, there are areas of rising cost on the horizon. After making deep staff cuts in 2020, Marriott needs to rebuild its workforce. For sure, the most painful part of this entire pandemic was about the furloughs and the layoffs that we had to do. It was necessary to survive, to make sure we got through to the other side. Now the company not only faces competition for workers in an economy reshaped by the pandemic, it's trying to do this while wages in the industry are rising and when customer and employee expectations are in a state of flux. One of the real things that sets a hotel apart from a home sharing platform like Airbnb is the services that they offer to guests. So there's an incredible tension as they work through you know, what those guest expectations are, what their strategic placement in the market is, uh, and what their you know, labor cost needs actually are. So I, I do think they need to uh, leverage technology to reduce the number of unskilled jobs in hotel operation. Uh, but they really need to provide jobs that require higher level of skills so that they can, they can reallocate part of their payroll to fewer workers and pay them better. We have been able to hire 40,000 people since the beginning of the year in 2021. And where you see it is in certain really hot markets. It's where you can see the shortages, but generally overall, it is improving. Technology may help Marriott meet this challenge as well. The company is rolling out a new labor management system that will more precisely match staffing to customer demand. This labor management system allows a hotel to much more um, assign labor just in time. So you're able to say, I see what's coming over the next couple days. I can work the shifts in a way that frankly gives the associates more flexibility, but also makes the staffing levels more appropriate. It used to be prior that it would be more of, okay, I'm gonna plan for all of next month. Done, your work shift, you know what it is. Now there's more flexibility and more adaptability to what's happening in the business of the hotel. Flexibility and agility will be critical assets for Marion in the foreseeable future. With leisure travel driving the demand recovery and the forecast for business travel still uncertain, hotel companies are hoping to attract a hybrid customer, adapting their spaces and services to a category known as pleasure. You're going to be reminding people to say, hey, you know, take your family for the weekend, but maybe stay an extra night. And we have the business center and we have the guaranteed Wi-Fi and reception that uh, can ensure that you can get business done from perhaps the pool or the beach on uh, come Monday morning. Where I'm a business traveler, where I likely will choose mobile check-in, mobile key, come up the elevator straight to my room. Then I may go on a family vacation. I want to talk to the front desk clerk and find out about a restaurant that no tourists are aware of. So now when you look around this hotel and you look, before it would be really easy to tell exactly who was on a business trip and who was here, you know, uh, seeing the city for leisure. Now, much more of a blend. 
people staying longer over a weekend, that means we need to have space that works for everyone, no matter what the purpose. For hotels, conventions, big events, drawing big revenue, right? What do you do after the pandemic when perhaps we won't have as many conventions and events as in the past? Well, I think first of all, we ultimately will. Uh, that business is coming back. I think one of the interesting things we're seeing in the group business is that people are not canceling farther out. They're canceling uh, really close in where there's still some discomfort in traveling, but where there is bookings that they feel comfortable doing in the next few months, those bookings are ramping up. So we've seen group get better and better and better with each quarter of this year, and we're actually really excited about what we see uh, in 2022. Lini Oberg's job always keeps her on her toes, and when she's not on the job, her favorite pursuits are active as well. I love to run. I've been part of a women's running group for 23 years, and we still run together three times a week. How does that help you in the day-to-day -day job and the grind that it is to be a CFO of such a big corporation? You know, it's always been for me a way to clean my head. Uh, you know, a lot of people say they run with music. I generally don't run with anything. I really like the time to think, reflect. You've always heard the saying that people get their best ideas when they're out for a run. There's no doubt there's something to that. Up next, Lini Oberg believes a chief future officer must be a good listener to be a good leader. I actually find that the listening is where some of the best decisions get made. And she says some of the best ideas come from a business culture of diversity. Over 60% of my global finance team are women. Um, over a third are people of color. It makes us a better company, not only from ideas, but from performance. This is Bloomberg. Marriott's investments in the future extend well beyond the doors of its hotels. In February 2021, the Marriott Foundation announced a $20 million endowment to launch the Marriott Sorensen Center for Hospitality Leadership at Howard University. The partnership with a historically black institution aims not just to bring more diversity to the industry, but to give students the tools to rise to the top. So when we first spoke about this, it was about building a true partnership really trying to solve for an issue, and that is the lack of underrepresented minorities, especially at the upper echelon of these industries, and that, was, that is problematic. And what this is, is to provide a solution. And I think the positioning of that center uh, is really unique in, in, in being the, the, one of the first to say publicly, we will not develop entry-level workers. We're gonna develop people that you will need to take seriously. When you look at the travelers around the globe, it's a very diverse group of travelers. And promoting diversity promotes new thought, new ideas. Um, it makes organizations stronger, it makes organizations better. Uh, it requires deliberate focus to drive the sort of um, diverse workforce that we want. If you look at our C-suite, more than 50% of my direct reports are diverse. Uh, if you look at our board, more than 50% of our board composition is diverse. On the diversity inclusion side, you know, I'm particularly proud in finance. We have over 60% of my global finance team are women. Um, over a third are people of color. It makes us a better company, not only from ideas, but from performance. The number of women chief financial officers has been steadily rising over the last decade and a half. A study of nearly 700 companies shows their representation doubling since 2004. Lini Oberg intends to keep the trend towards diversity going as a mentor in all areas of business. One of my uh, overall beliefs is really important for leaders to be approachable. And so the more that I can talk to anyone in my shop or frankly even out of my discipline about what they're doing and how they're thinking about it, hopefully it's helpful for both them and for the company. Unflappable, responsible and approachable. Lini Oberg has the expertise and the people skills to steer Marriott into the future. I asked her what she sees when she looks ahead. What's the opportunity for Marriott in the next 10 years that most excites you? 
we are all about being the world's favorite travel company. And there are so many more places for us to grow and so many more ways for us to connect with our consumers. I do think our size and scale gives us a unique opportunity. And when I think about those opportunities, we got to get at them. We got to make sure that we go and take advantage of them. And so a, a lot of this is about the translation of business strategy and financial resources and putting them together in a way that provides value to all of our constituencies. What's the challenge for Marriott in the next 10 years that keeps you up at night? Pace of change. Pace of change. Uh, you know, all of, us, uh, all of us have seen that technology has meant that the pace of change has only accelerated. Uh, when I think about when we would start a brand initiative 20 years ago versus when you start it now and how quickly it takes to get it done and rolled out, and what customers expect. They expect things really quickly. All of us, you know, you're on your smartphone, you're like, well, why didn't I get that answer right away? And I think that is uh, one, of our, one of our biggest challenges is trying to keep up with the pace of change. How do you see your role as CFO changing in the next 10 years? Of course, you've got the standard parts of the CFO role in reporting uh, accurately and with great transparency of our results and our uh, state of health critically important, but just as important is really helping the company find ways to accelerate growth. For me, it is very much about how to enable the growth that we want to achieve. What's a skill set or area of expertise that the CFO will need to develop in the next 10 years? Deep understanding of technology and where technology is going, I think is number one. I think communication skills the need for good communication skills is only going to continue to increase. Uh, you know, the old days you had the classic view of the CFO with the green eye shades kind of sitting and making sure the numbers all got tallied appropriately. I think it's much broader now. And it really is about making sure that all the constituencies understand the strategy and the value that you're trying to deliver. What's the best advice that you'd give to somebody who got promoted to the CFO level today? Love what you do. It's really important that you love what you do. And then the other one is about listening. You know, as a, as a leader, there's this expectation that perhaps you're going to come out with what everybody should go do in the edict of this is the way we go. I actually find that the listening is where some of the best decisions get made it's by listening to team members so that you can say, I want to take part of that point of view and that point of view to get to the best decision and strategy for the company. And that takes really listening. Leaders who listen are essential to a company that's determined to innovate especially when its industry is in transition. That ability to lead, combined with a willingness to learn, makes Lini Oberg a chief future officer. I'm Shemri This is Bloomberg.